Reporting started. Hey everybody, this is the third video in my how-to series for setting up your home lab for a CCIE collaboration. Uh, today I'm going to go ahead, when I finish this video, I'm going to go back in and cut out the, any long pauses, um, so those should not be in the final cut of this video. Uh, what I'm going to walk through today is setting up an Active Directory domain controller. Uh, anything I present here is used for your own knowledge. If you use this in a production environment, you will be on your own. Um, I am going to show you how to do some semi-high-end functions of Active Directory, if, and if you were to do them incorrectly in a production environment, you could definitely break things. So I want to get that warning out of the way. Um, so where I left off in the last video, I have now set up all my virtual switches in my ESX host. I've copied up my ISOs to my uh, ESX host, so I'm now at the point where I can start installing a virtual machine. And again, today I'm going to do an Active Direct domain, domain Controller. This is the first server you will want to bring up in your lab. It's important to get this out of the way mostly because DNS. Um, eventually, you will want to use it for LDAP integration when you're working on that component of your lab. Um, but before you start building your other call manager, you know, Unity, Presence, UCCX, you will want to get the DNS situated. So you may as well just build the server outright to begin with. It doesn't take very long anyways. Um, you cannot install UCCX without your DNS server. So you can get away with installing Call Manager, Unity, and Presence, but you won't be able to get through the UCCX install until your DNS is in place. And again, when you're setting up your lab, you want to set it all up to include DNS anyway, so you're going to want to do this first. All right, enough of that. Uh, let me go ahead and get this started. I'm going to share my desktop, and this is the interface for ESX. This is my host server. Um, right over here in the left-hand corner is my actual server, um, so I'm going to right-click on that and do a new virtual machine. This is going to be a typical uh, setup. You could do a custom install if you want. Um, that allows you to tailor all kinds of settings. Um, unless you really care and really want to do something fancy, you're going to want to just stick with a typical configuration. So click Next. We're going to name this virtual machine. This isn't the name of the machine presented to the network. This is just what you're going to call it within ESX. I'm going to call this um, Domain Controller. So click Next. Uh, next it asks which data store I want to uh, install this on. Most likely you only have one in your server. Uh, in my case, I'm just going to use the first one, which is fine. So I'm going to hit Next. Now, depending on what you choose here is how it's going to configure the virtual machine. So that this will tell it is it 64-bit or not. Is it how much memory is it? It'll guesstimate how much disk space you're going to need, so on and so forth. I'm going to be installing Server 2012 R2 today, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. Let me hit Next. Um, again, I had already set up my virtual switches in the last video, so I'm going to be putting this on VLAN 6. That is where you will want to place this server. So, Next. Next is the question, do you want to thin provision or thick provision your virtual hard drive? If you thin provision it, it'll basically just write a very small file. I think it's about two megs in size or so. And as it grows, it will use more and more physical disk space. However, this amount that you set here, so if we have 40 gigs, if you thin provision it, the file will never be able to grow beyond 40 gigabytes. If you thick provision it, it'll go ahead and just write a whole 40 gig file, and it's just going to have a lot of white space in it. Um, supposedly, it's a little bit faster. There's also a scenario where if you were to thin provision a bunch of hard drives and you actually run out of physical disk space because you didn't plan correctly, uh, all your virtual hard drives have the potential of becoming corrupted, and so you could run into a scenario where all your virtual machines are completely hosed up. Um, since this is a lab, I would go ahead and thin provision this. If this was a you know, production environment, I would thick provision it, but that's just my preference. Um, at this point, I get finish and it would build the virtual machine. I want to edit one setting, though, before I move on. So let me go ahead and select the mark to edit this and continue. Um, what I want to do is I want to set up the CD-ROM. So I have copied my ISOs up to my server, and they are sitting on the data store. So I'm going to go ahead and select a data store ISO. And I'm going to browse to that location. They are on Data Store 1 for me. They're in the ISOs folder, and it is this English Windows Server 2012 R2 X64 DVD. 
I'm going to go ahead and select that. Um, I want to make sure that this is connected to power on. If I don't do this, when I turn on this virtual machine, it's going to come up and say, I've got nothing to boot to. If that happens, you can always go back in here, reset this, it's fine. Um, but just be aware that if you boot your virtual machine and it's saying that it doesn't have anything to boot to, it's because you probably forgot to turn this on. Let's go ahead and connect it to power up and finish. Let me go ahead and select this virtual machine. Now I get a couple of new options at the top here. Um, I want to talk through a couple of these tabs. Uh, the summary will kind of tell you what's been allocated, what's being used. When this is running, it'll tell you how much CPU is being used, how much memory is being used, um, how much disk space you you set aside. You can also go into the performance to see real time how much you know uh, CPU is being used. This is kind of uh, important when you're looking at your call managers because if your call managers have not completely booted up, you'll see them using a lot of CPU. And so if you're wondering, ah, you know, is this thing coming online or not, you can go look at you know the current performance of it to see, you know, how much har hardware resources it's, it's utilizing at the moment. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and click on this little button right here. This brings up the actual console for this virtual machine. So let's power it on. Go ahead and expand it out a little bit. Okay, and we are booting. Now, at the moment, my mouse and keyboard are still tied to my, uh, the workstation I'm working off of. If I want to bring them into here, I just click once, and you notice my mouse goes away, and now I'm moving it inside the virtual machine. I cannot get outside of the constraints of the virtual machine. Anything I type or anywhere I move my mouse will go on the virtual machine. To break out of that, you press Control-Alt. So then you can see I hit Control-Alt, and now I can move my mouse outside of the virtual machine. So let me go ahead and go back in. This is the very first screen for Windows Server, so let's go ahead and hit Next, and let's hit Install. Now, it looks, it's looking for a product key. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my desktop so I can input the key. So I'm going to do that right now. Okay, so I have inputted my key and click next. Let me go ahead and reshare my desktop. And this is the next screen. Here it's asking if you want to do a graphical install or just a core install. If you do a core install, you will be greatly limiting the ability of your server. And it's really for somebody who knows what they're doing with Windows Server. You usually only use that if you're using it for one specific case and you can get away with a core install. A lot of things these days won't even run off a core installed um, Windows Server. So for this case, we're going to definitely do the server with a GUI. Let's go ahead next. Uh, accept the license terms, next, and we are going to do a custom install. All that really does is it would allow me to partition the hard drive if I want. I don't want to do any of that because we're just going to use the whole C drive for this. So uh, it's already selected. I'm just going to hit next. Uh, at this point, it's going to take about five minutes to get to the first screen after the install. So I will uh, cut this part out of the video. So the next thing you guys should see is me uh, at the very first screen. Okay, everybody, we are back. Uh, the install is completed for Windows Server. Uh, the very first screen you're presented with is a screen to change the password for the local administrator account of this machine. This is a local account, not a domain account. Obviously, we don't have a domain built yet, so this is a local account to this machine. Let me go ahead and put in a password and confirm it. And I'm going to hit Enter. Uh, once this gets done finalizing, I'm going to have to log in. In order to send Control Alt Delete to your server, you can press Control Alt Insert. You can also click on the link above, which I will show you that as well. So again, you're going to have to hit Control Escape to break out of the machine because you won't even be able to click on the, control, the Send Control Delete until you've done that. Um, should just take another second here. All right. So there we are. 
again, I can, if I was inside of the machine, I can press Control and Insert. Otherwise, I can hit VM, uh, Guest, Send Control Alt Delete. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm going to click back in the machine so I can type in my password. And it is going to go to the desktop. Now, the very first thing I want to do, I want to do a little housekeeping before we install Active Directory Domain Services. Uh, I'm going to walk through the differences between Server 2012 and Server 2008, uh, but the things I'm going to do right now will be applicable to both versions. So let's go ahead and start with those few things. Um, also, this is 2012 R2 without Rollup 1. When I click on the Windows key, you'll notice that this is administrator up here. If I were to click on this, all I can do is lock the machine or sign out. If I want to reboot the computer, make this a little bigger. If I want to reboot the computer, I have to click over this, click this little gear, power, and then I can reboot it. Now, if this was 2012R2 with the roll-up, it will add a power button right here so you can save you one step. It's not really, Microsoft didn't do a whole lot to bring back our start bar, but uh, at least there's that. Let's go ahead and go over to the control panel. I like to always change my view to small icons. Uh, very first thing I want to do, I want to go in and statically assign the IP address. We're going to go to Network and Sharing Center. Let's change the adapter settings. I'm going to right click on the network adapter and go to Properties. The IP address that you will want to use is 10. Dot, oh, so numlock. 10.1.6.8. Triple two five five. The gateway will be ten dot one dot six dot one. You will want to set the DNS server to be the, to be the IP address of this server because this is going to be the DNS for the domains. Ten dot one dot six dot eight. If you don't fill this in, it will add in one twenty seven dot zero dot zero dot one when you make this a domain control. So hit OK and OK. And let's go back. Uh, let's go ahead and go back to the control panel. I, would, I want to turn off the Windows Firewall. Now, you're going to need to do this twice, so let's go turn it off, off, off. What is not listed here is domain network settings. Um, it's not a domain controller and it's not a member of a domain, so that, that setting will not exist until you've made this into a domain controller or joined a domain. Uh, let's go back to the control panel, and I want to set up so I can remote into this device. So let's go to System. Let's go to Remote Settings. Allow Remote Connections. Go ahead and hit the OK warning. And then I want to deselect this so that I can use any version of RDP to connect to this. So I'm going to hit OK. Um, and last, let's give this thing a name. I'm going to call this thing DC001. Um, you can call it whatever you like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. After it changes the name, it's going to ask me to reboot. Um, I want to do a couple more things before I get that far. So let's hit OK, close, I will restart later. Now, we can close out the control panel. Inside Server 2008, Server Manager looks a little different than it does in 2012, but this, you should be able to, this should be pretty self-explanatory where you find the changes I want to make. Well, really, there's only really one change I want to make at this point. So, in 2012, you need to click on the local server. You're going to want to go to this IE Enhanced Security Configuration. Click on the hyperlink there and turn it off. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a hell of a time doing anything with Internet Explorer. So let me go ahead and hit OK. Now, I need to break out of this machine. I want to go over here to VM, Guest, and I want to install, oh, yep, I want to install the tools. And OK. What it's going to do is it's going to remap my DVD drive inside this virtual machine so that it will now have the files to install. And there you go. So it's there now mounted as a D drive. I'm going to go ahead and click OK to run this setup. Pretty much close everything else because when this completes, it's going to ask to reboot, and at that point, it'll be fine. Okay, you can use all the defaults. You notice that things run pretty quick. Virtual machines tend to run very fast. Um, I especially like the fact that they uh, will reboot very quickly. So after I hit next, this thing should shut down and start back up in just seconds, probably 30 seconds flat. So hit finish, and yes, it's okay to reboot. And 
There we go. It's already down and already coming back up. Now, what that uh, the VMware tools do, it does a few things. It loads drivers. It loads the network interface driver. It loads the video driver, if you have sound card, all that good stuff. Um, it also will synchronize the clock with the host. Uh, so it's, it's a good thing. I've actually seen old VMware servers where the virtual machine started getting really random time that will fix that issue. Modern machines shouldn't have that issue, but it's always good to install tools. All right, so Control-Alt-Insert. And let's log in. And now we're going to go through the process of actually turning this into an Active Directory domain controller. If you are running Server 2008 R2, what you will want to do at this point is go to Start Run and type DC Promo. Since I'm running 2012, it is a little different. Let's go ahead and add a role to this. Actually, I need to wait. It's still kind of loading up Server Manager. It'll scream at me if I don't wait till that's done. So let me let that finish. All right, looks good. So let's add a role. Next. This is a role-based or feature-based installation. Next. We're doing it to this server. That is correct. Next. And we're going to do the Active Directory domain services. And just go ahead and hit Add Features. This, these are the prerequisites to make that happen. You can add those because you're going to need them. Next. And at this point, next, 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 because you're, you're not going to be doing anything else. Uh, you could go ahead and restart the destination server if required. It actually won't be required, so it's not going to do anything if I did that or not. Let's hit install. All this is doing at this point is just loading the binary files. It doesn't actually make it a domain controller yet. Uh, if you're doing 2008 R2, what you'll notice is as soon as you type, type DC promo, it basically does this part, puts the binaries on, and then it'll take you to this, the next screen that you'll see here. Once, once I finish this, it, it'll then look exactly the same. So let me let this finish. should take less than a minute. Now, DNS services will be installed when you install Active Directory. If you really wanted to, you could install DNS first and then turn it into a domain controller. I would recommend not doing that. Uh, sometimes it can screw up the zones. I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can go in and fix them all. It's really not a big deal, but why go to the trouble when it can just be done correctly the first time? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and promote this server to a domain controller. So at this point, if you've gone, if you have a 2008 server, you should now pretty much be at the same screen. We are not adding this to an existing domain. We are not adding this domain to an existing forest. This is all new. So we're going to add a new forest. The root domain name. You are welcome to call this whatever you like. I'm going to, since I'm building this server for personal use, I'm going to base it around my domain name, beyondvoip.net. I'm going to click Next. It's going to go out, look and see if there's any other domains or any other servers using that domain. Obviously, it doesn't find anything because there's nothing else in my network. Now, fourth functional level, domain functional level. The domain level can be higher than the forest level, but the forest level cannot be higher than the domain level. What is all this stuff for? Well, different versions of Windows Server, newer versions of Windows Servers add more and more features. In order for backwards compatibility, you may need to make your forest functional level you know, 2008, your domain level 2000 R2. This only matters if you have older domain controllers and or want to install older, older domain controllers, which I don't know why the hell you would ever do that, but let's just say you wanted to do that, this is how it would, it would work. Now, I have zero purpose for using older stuff in my lab. I'm not, I, this is going to be the only domain controller I have. I'm going to keep everything at the highest level. Leave these de default. This is what I was talking about. It will install DNS for you. You have to have a global catalog server, so that is grayed out. You cannot do an, a read-only domain controller um, until you've already installed one domain controller. Then you could do a force prep later on. Uh, again, we're only using one domain controller. Absolutely no service, no purpose. So what I need to do is set up a password. This password is exclusively for the use. If you had to force demote an Active Directory domain controller, this will allow you to restore the server, even if you lost all your other passwords. So I'm going to, again, give it a password. Okay. Next. Um, you don't need to do anything here. Click Next. 
net bio snail. This should actually fill in in a second. Yeah, you can see the little gray bar. You may or may not see that in your video. This gray bar is kind of going by. It's looking at all the settings. This should fill in with beyond VoIP, and there it is. This is a net BIOS name, not a DNS name. So that's why it does not say .NET at the end. Next. And where do you want to store the sysball, logs, all that stuff? Default is perfectly fine. Even in a production environment, I always leave these default. I don't see any reason to move these to another hard drive. So next. And it's just going to give you a review. Okay, we're going to make a this is the configure this server as an Active Directory domain controller in a new domain beyond VoIP. This is the NetBIOS name, force functional level, blah, 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 blah. Next, it's going to go through, check the prereqs. It's going to come back with a warning letting you know that, uh, hey, if you're going to do it at this force level, this domain level, you will not be able to, you know, log into an NT4 server. If you're still using NT4, I feel really bad for you. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hit install. Now, when this is done, there will no longer be local accounts on this machine. I probably should have shown you guys. If you go to the control panel, administrative tools, and computer management, there would have been a thing that says um, local users and groups. That will disappear once Active Directory has been installed on this server. And the only way to control your groups and users is through Active Directory users and computers. Um, once this is finished, it should ask me to reboot. You can see it's creating the objects. This is almost done. Set policies, set in the DNS. And you're about to be signed out. So the server is going to be rebooted. Uh, it has to do that because at this point, the local account that I'm logged into won't exist. So we're going to close everything. Um, I don't know if it was going to reboot automatically. It's actually, I haven't, there we go. Yeah, it's rebooting automatically. Now, the first boot after installing after directory services actually takes a minute. Um, so don't be too concerned that it's taken longer than normal. It'll only be the first boot after doing this. Okay, I'll boot it up after the first go around with Active Directory. 
So we're going to send Control Alt in, uh, Delete by doing Control Alt Insert. And now you'll notice that it is beyond VoIP slash administrator. So this is now a domain account. Let me go ahead and log in. It is going to launch Server Manager again as it always does. Let me show you how to turn that off in 2012. At this point, if you're going to be only using this for the purpose of your CCIE lab, you're not going to want to install anything else. Let's go ahead and, I think it's manage, um, error, sorry, manage, come on, server manager properties, and do not start on log on. Hit OK, close this out, you don't need to look at that screen again. Now, let's go ahead and set up our DNS. That was kind of the whole point of this. So you're going to need to go to your administrative tools and I'll bring up a box. I'm going to copy out this to the desktop. So there's my shortcut to DNS. That way I don't have to go through this, you know, their funky start menu to get to that anymore. <clears throat> We're also going to want to copy Active Directory users and computers to the desktop because we'll be using that semi-frequently as well. Let's go ahead and close this out. And DNS. All right. You have forward zones and reverse zones. If you have put all your forward zones in place, all your A records, and your call manager is still complaining that it can't contact your DNS server, it is because you forgot to create your reverse lookup zones. Let's do that first. So right click on the reverse lookup zones and do a new zone. Next. It is a primary zone. Next. Uh, you can copy to all DNS servers, there will only be one, it doesn't matter. Next. It's IP4, next. And the network ID. So I need one for 10.1.5. Next, and next finish, new zone, primary zone, all servers, IP4, 10.1.6, next, next finish, new zone, 10.1, oops, 10.1.7, next, next finish. Okay, don't forget. You will be using DNS in your branch too. 10.1.130. Next, next finish. Don't forget your Uni Express module. 10.1.131. Next, next finish. Okay, all your reverse zones are done. Let's go to the forward zone. Now, I could use beyondvoip.net, that would be perfectly acceptable. You may want to stick more with uh, this, the collaboration uh, lab topology. I'm going to go ahead and create a new zone just so I can show you guys what happens here. So right click on the forward zones, do a new zone. Primary zone to all DNS servers. What would I like to call it? I'm going to call this Cisco CiscoTestLab.com. Next. Uh, again. There isn't going to be any updates. You're going to manually put in these DNS entries and never touch us again. So the defaults are all fine. And so now we have CiscoTestLab.com, and it's just got this, the Active Directory records in there. Let's right click and do a new A record. So new host, A or quadruple A. And what are we going to call it? Let's go ahead and go down the list. Let's start with PubHQ. What IP address? 10.1.5.2. Do not forget create the associated PTR record. Again, your DNS isn't working, you probably forgot to do that. Let's add the host. Let's go sub HQ. 10.1.5.3. Let's go cuck HQ. 10.1.5.4. Let's go im-p-hq. 10.1.5.5. Nope, shoot, I put that wrong. Let's do it again. Can't. Sorry. Done. 10.1.5.5. Okay, let's go back. New record. UCCX HQ. 10.1.5.6. Okay, that's all my HQ stuff. Do my backbone, pub db. 10.1.6.2, sub dash bb. 10.1.6.3, sub 
All right. If you have BCS, good for you. BCS BBB B10.1.6.7. Okay, and then TMS-BB. This is actually this server. This is the Telepresence Management Suite. I'm not going to install it on this server, but this is the host for this is the IP address for this host. 10.1.6.8. All right, uh, let's move on to my branch one. So pub br1, 10.1.7.2. And we're going to do a unity over there. So cuck br1, 10.1.7.4. And we're going to do a present server over there. im p br1, 10.1.7.5. And finally, we're going to do our Unity Express module, BR2, 10.1.131.2. Okay, let's look through all our records. So 5234566237827475, and that's correct. All looks good. Names look good. Your DNS is done. Now if you go look at your reverse DNS records, it has created those reverse records for you. Again, if your DNS is complaining, and you know you got connectivity, this is your problem. Make sure this is here. It has to exist before you even start on UCCX. DNS is done, you don't need to think about this ever again. Let's go ahead and add some users though because you may want to LDAP integrate your, um, your whole lab. Let me get the names and the users here. I'm just gonna find it, one second. Okay, so I'm gonna use my Beyond VoIP domain. I will show you in a second how you can find the actual LDAP connection uh, information, uh, the easy way in my opinion. But let's go ahead and create my users first. So new user, username will be John Doe, J Doe. Uh, you're going to need to put a password here. Let's go ahead and use something complex. Um, we haven't gone and modified the group policies of Windows Server, so if you don't use a complex password, it will it'll complain at you. Um, let's do Jane White, J White. Okay, Mary Smith. M Smith. Mike Black, M Black, okay, Peter Brown, P Brown. Okay, Scott Green. S Green. Now, don't forget, when it comes to LDAP and Call Manager, Call Manager will not suck these users in until you have put in their phone numbers. So let's go ahead and put their extensions in. So John Doe is 2001. Jane White, 2002. Mary Smith, 3001. Mike Black, 3002. Peter Brown, 4001. And Scott Green, 5001. Where'd you go, Scott? There you are. 5001, our backbone user. Okay, After Directory is all done. If you want to create a larger OU structure, you're welcome to do that. Um, you may want to do something along the lines of new uh, organizational unit. We'll call this, you know, uh, beyond VoIP users. And then we could move my users under that. Or let's say that we really wanted to break it down and we have, you know, we wanted to go OU, we could say Pacific 
you know, for my Pacific time zone users. And then I can move them here and so on and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and delete these. You're welcome to do that if you like. Um, all right. Uh, with 20, with, I think with the advent of 2008, they set it up so that um, it, you had to go to a lot of trouble to delete OUs. Uh, I'm going to change the view to advanced features. Um, let me go back to my Beyond VoIP. I need to go to the properties here. I need to go to, this, to oops, the object tab, remove the protection, let me remove the protection. Okay, now I can delete these. Done. Okay, so we're back to just my users. Now, let me show you how you can actually get the fully qualified domain name um, of these users. Since you're going to be using LDAP, you're going to need to know all that information. Be very careful doing this in a production environment. You don't ever want to make changes under ADSI edit unless you're being told to from an engineer or something along those lines. Um, this is obviously a test domain. I'm not too concerned. but be very, very, very careful using this tool. So ADSI edit. And we need to connect to my domain. So action, connect to, defaults are fine. When you click it, it loads up. So click it, it loads up. At this point, this is the top of my domain structure, DC equals beyond VoIP, comma, DC equals net. Uh, let's go ahead and expand that. Let's go to my users. You can see there's the there's full distinguished name of all my users. If you wanted more information, you can right click, you can go to properties, and everything you ever wanted to know about a person is right here. You could also modify this stuff. I would say you're pretty much insane if you want to modify the information within here, but you certainly could. Um, if anything, you, I only ever use this to just view information like this. Um, again, the only times I've ever used this tool to actually make an active directory change is when I was on the phone with Microsoft Tech Support. That is a wrap. Your Active Directory domain is built. Your DNS server is built. Um, if I can think of anything else, I will leave it in the notes on my video. Oh, you know what? I want to show you how you guys can make it so you don't have to use difficult passwords. Let's go ahead and go to Administrative Tools. This is a group policy, and it is going to be, there's only one policy by default. So. It is the default domain policy. We're going to right click on this, uh, edit, and actually, uh, where is the rest of my view? If I click on the domain policy, should, if you go into settings, it'll show you what's actually set. Go into that, you can see policies, Windows settings, security settings. So let's go to there. Policies, Windows settings. Security settings, all right, and show me what they set. Yeah, okay. Account policies. Uh, password policies, okay, there we go. So right now we have enforced password history. Let's turn that off. Um, if you are, you can set this to zero. If you're going to define it, you have to set something. Otherwise, you can just not define it, and it's just off. Let's go ahead and set the password age. Turn that off. I don't want to define it. That's fine. It's also telling me, hey, you know, you it's going to conflict with this. That's fine. We'll fix that too. Um, minimum password length seven. I don't, uh, you know, we don't need that. Passwords must meet complexity requirements. This is the one that pisses everybody off. Go ahead and it is defined enabled. You could define it disabled. Um, that's what I would recommend. And that's it. That should do it. You should be able to set your passwords now to something simple. Um, so if you've gone all the way through this, you, may, you probably want to go back now and reset your passwords, Cisco123. Okay, everybody, if I can think of anything else, I'll put them in the notes of the video. Otherwise, thank you very much. If you have questions, let me know.